out to get the gavel. Call this <laughs> meeting in order. Thank you very much, County, for doing that. Uh, we we do have a quorum, and Councillor Erickson is calling in on on the phone. The uh, and I believe we have public input today as well, too. So uh, anybody here for public input may uh, step forward at this point in time. State your name. Thank you, Councilman Kylie. This is uh, Joe Kipley. And I just wanted to uh, speak today to give you some positive feedback, maybe for a, a change at some of these government hearings of just that uh, really think highly of uh, your leadership over this entity with Scott McMahon. I uh, got a great tour from him and uh, Matt Tooley, another great guy, kind of oriented me to some of the things in emergency management and uh, the 911 call center. And another thing that maybe isn't news to you, but uh, they're doing their best with a pretty tough facility there. Um, and so it was amazing to see the work that they do, uh, but also it's, it's good to look forward to the future where they're going to have it with the law enforcement training center, a, a better facility. So just wanted to give you that positive report and feedback that uh, you've got a great team running the show there and uh, looking forward to the great things that they'll do in the future. That's all I had. Thank you for your time. Joe, thank you very much. We appreciate that uh, feedback. It is a team effort. Do we have anybody else for public input? Yeah. Uh, my name is Lenora Giles, and I would just like to ask, as you go into executive session later, um, that you take a heartfelt consideration for our COLA negotiations that are going on. Um, we are excited about the new facility. Um, we think we've presented a very modest and reasonable offer, and you can certainly add to that if you see fit to help with retention and recruitment and all of the things that we're struggling with right now. But um, there were several employees that were going to be here, but some of them have had some illness, but they are watching. So thanks, guys. And if you guys would just take some really heartfelt consideration and try to, try to make us the best center that we can and continue to grow. But to do that, we need, we need a, a COLA that's going to help support that. Thank you. Lenore, well, thank you for your input. Appreciate it. Do we have anybody else here for public input? Okay, great. Seeing none, uh, next item, approval of uh, the minutes dated uh, December 15th, 2021. Move to approve. Okay. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Uh, we'll do a roll call, call vote. Uh, do you want to call out? Um, Here. <laughs> no, I'm good. Dean Carsey? Aye. Yes. Yes. That passes unanimously. Okay, next on the item is our director's report. Good afternoon, Council. Uh, Scott McMahon, Director of Metro Communications. And uh, as our public speaker said today, um, thanks to all the work that our communication operators do in our center. They are truly the success of our organization and appreciate everything that they do on a day to day basis. Getting into our first item on our director's report, um, it's related to staffing. Currently, we do have four vacant operator positions within our agency. Thus far in 2022, we have had three resignations. Um, two of those resignations have been for the purposes of, of schedules uh, or scheduling, fitting their, their, um, their needs. And two of those employees that resigned said that they would like to come back and work in a uh, temporary status for our organization. So that's very much appreciated that they're they're willing to come back. It's just you know some scheduling issues uh, kept them from working full time. And currently uh, we have four operators that are in training in our agency. The next item on the list uh, again has to do with recruitment and retention uh, across the nation. We continue to see struggles in the 91 profession to fill. Uh, communication operator positions. As a result of that, we did some strategic planning as a leadership team, and the result of that was that we are going to introduce more um, training sessions this year or more recruit classes this year. And as a result of those additional classes, we will have more operators trained sooner in being able to take telephone calls and process emergency medical dispatch type of calls. So that will help us in that regard, 
but as a result of that, we have to postpone the, the last portion of their traditional training, which would be the fire board operation. Um, so we're bringing people into the agency sooner, training them sooner on the front end, but their last component of training will take it a little bit longer to get to that piece. So, um, but as a result of that, we are able to bring in more classes. We do intend to, to have four different classes this year, four different start dates for operators. So any questions on what those changes are about or the intent? Next item is uh, pertaining to our new facility. We have had regular contact with two major vendors for our new facility. Uh, one of those is Motorola. Our pricing on our Motorola is, um, is under contract. However, the availability of the product will depend upon um, our current market these days and our current uh, economy. So there may be some, some delays there. So we may have to place an order sooner than intended. However, payment will still be in 2023, so there should not be a need to change um, any financial considerations that we've already had. We also have been in contact with our preferred dispatch furniture council vendor, and although we've seen an increase in product, shipping, and installation costs, um, we've been able to make some adjustments to uh, still acquire the amount of furniture that we're comfortable with and, and still stay within budget. The next item is uh, we try and recognize uh, a healthy work-life balance for our staff. We try and do everything that we can to make sure that we have 24-7 coverage for our community, but at the same time recognize that our staff have personal needs in their, in their own personal lives. So what we did is we spent a lot of time, about a year, studying 12-hour shifts and how that would impact our staff. Uh, we did put it to a vote of our staff, and it turned out that it's about a 50-50 split. So 50% were willing to go to 12s, the other 50% wanted to stay in eight-hour shifts. Um, so as a result of that survey and as a result of all that research that we did, um, we'll stay on eight-hour shifts at this time unless uh, you know, we, we find that there's different alternatives to the, the plan that we presented. So, but at this time, we'll stay in eight-hour eight hour shifts. Uh, during its past year, it's come to our attention that our Motorola radio councils in our current facility, um, they are no longer being manufactured under that uh, particular um, release, I guess is what I'd call it, that product release. So uh, as of September 2021, we can't buy additional components for our radio system that we have today. Uh, instead, we have to plan for replacement by year 2028. Um, we're, we're waiting on a quote from our Motorola vendor to, to help us in determining how much that will cost. Um, we do believe that uh, you know, there may be some assistance in the form of grants and so forth, but right now it's just something that we have to consider by 2028 we have to replace our current radio equipment. Chair? Yes. Can I clarify a little bit of what's going on there if you don't mind, Scott? So, we're building a new facility, we're putting all new radio equipment in. Correct. This radio equipment's going to be obsolete. Right. Okay. So it needs to be planned for obsolescence by 2028, and we Correct. need to refurnish what we have here. Correct. Okay. How many, how many units? So right now we have 11 units or 11 radio council positions. Um, at Metro, we're not able to expand that because, like I said, they're they're not making the product anymore. So, how many are um, we putting at the new facility? At our new facility, we'll have 24 positions. 24. Okay. So we're going to double, or almost double, what we have today. Plus, we'll have the 11 at our backup center. So, in in essence, we'll have um, 35. Who else has backup centers? What other PSAPs around us that we could maybe reach out to and say, "Hey, we'll be your backup, but we need help." Or we, we want to work together on this? Sure. Um, I do know that there are backup centers, you know, across the state. I, I don't know, you know, regionally in this area who all has a backup center or what their backup center capabilities are. Okay. Have we talked to any of them or is that a conversation? I mean, we have a county association, county commissioners, and I, do you guys have some sort of way that you can communicate amongst yourselves? Sure. As a matter of fact, uh, about a month ago, I attended the state 91 meeting, coordination board meeting in Pier, mm -hmm. and uh, one of the discussions we had deals with the rising cost of 
you know, equipment and staff and all the things that go into 911 operations. And uh, at least at that meeting, it, there, was, there was some discussion about, you know, trying to seek partnerships, trying to do things collaboratively, um, trying to make the best use of 911 funds. Mm -hmm. um, we're all in the same business of competing for the same staff. Mm -hmm. And like I say, there's a limited number of, of people that um, are entering the profession. So it makes sense as much as possible to collaborate and do things under one operation instead of multiple. We have 34 PSAPs. I don't think we need 34 backup centers in this state. I mean, it, to me, it makes sense. So that'd be a good place. You know, my position, I've been advocating for um, more efficiency in what we do across the state. And to yeah. me, that'd be, seemed like it'd be a great place to start. Yeah. The uh, PSAPs in the state that have partnered with, um, you know, with other agencies or other counties um, typically have a higher percent of surcharges, 9-1 surcharges that are covering their total operations versus one that doesn't have any partnerships, then it falls back on uh, surcharges as well as uh, city and county support mm -hmm. like we are in today. Okay. Commissioner, do you have any questions at all? Oh, the reason that uh, we formed this Metro Communication Agency in the first place was to expand locations, and that's been a, quite a few years ago, and at that time, I think we had the governor's support, but the legislators uh, decided not to pursue that, so still an uphill battle. I have a, a follow-up question too, Scott. If it did, for some reason, become necessary to replace one of our councils, uh, and, it, and it's after the September, well, it was at, uh, September of 21, according to this. So right. let's say something unforeseen takes place, power surge or what have you, and it takes out a council or two. Uh, are they compatible, uh, the new versus the existing? Would it have any interruption or impact on service? It's a good question because I asked the same question. Uh, so the new release of the radio equipment today or going into the new facility type of equipment, those are not compatible with what we have and they're not making any more of the product that we currently have. However, we're under a contractual agreement for maintenance that, uh, that requires the company to make sure that we stay in operation. So my guess is, is like any company, they have some that they'll save in reserve to cover their contractual agreements and uh, <clears throat> we'll be able to at least get parts or replacements, but we can't do additions. Okay, thank you. Okay, with that, we'll move on to the next item, uh, which talks about our temporary staff. We have uh, a great amount of support from our temporary staff. Just looking at the, the support that helps our, our dispatch operations, we had about 1,798 hours of assistance and that's 450 hours of vacation coverage, 362 hours of sick leave, 349 hours of supervisors being off the floor to work on supervisory tasks, 271 hours of training and meetings, 341 hours of extra staffing, and 25 hours of other assistance. In addition to these hours and these staff that help us on the floor, we also have uh, temporary staff that help us with recruitment um, and audio recordings as well. So we, we get a lot of assistance from our temporary staff and they're very much appreciated in, in our organization. Next item is uh, telephone calls. Just kind of want to give you uh, a glimpse here because I'll talk about it again in the budget report. But uh, in 2021, we managed 337,692 telephone calls for service. Uh, 105,671 of those were 91 calls, which is a 5.2 increase over the 2020 year. 171,884 of those were admin telephone calls, which is a 2.62 increase over 2020. And then 60,137 were outbound telephone calls, which is actually a decrease. And the reason for the decrease is there's other ways uh, to, to communicate with the law enforcement agencies and so forth so that we can you know, do that through chat, through messaging, through um, other, other ways of uh, communication. So that's, that's helped us to decrease that uh, number of outbound calls. Call answer times, this is something that I'm particularly proud of uh, because of across the nation, um, these stats are sometimes um, not always achieved. And these are NINA standards, the National Emergency Number Association has set standards. So in our agency, 89.93% of all 9-1 calls were answered in under 10 seconds. 
the NINA standard is actually under 15 seconds. 97.61% of all 911 calls answered in under 15 seconds, and 99% of our 911 calls were answered in under 20 seconds. That's just a, is a example of, of making sure that you have quality service available when, when somebody's in need of help. And I'll tell you that uh, I get monthly reports from the state, and these uh, same types of numbers are what we're seeing across the state. So in South Dakota, the response time to 911 calls is, is very good. Last thing on the list is just the total number of calls for service in 2021. We had 267,779 calls for service, which means that's a call in which a ambulance or a, a police or a fire apparatus is, is sent to um, a call. So law enforcement calls, 177,815, which is a 1.66% increase over 2020. Fire calls, um, 16,964, which is 2.3% increase. And then EMS calls, 25,624, which is a 10% increase over 2020. The final page uh, just talks about, again, phone calls in and out, but it just gives you a, a graph description of what takes place at each one of our councils. So you can see that there's PD East, PD West, uh, Minneapolis, Minneapolis County Sheriff's Office data. You can see that the number is trending downward at all of those councils, and that's by intent because we're trying to keep telephone calls off of councils where there's uh, you know more of a radio priority is needed. But you can see on uh, the call taker positions, those calls are actually increasing slightly. So we're, we're trying to have our call takers take the calls. We're trying to have our dispatchers dis dispatch the calls. And then the lower chart uh, talks about, again, calls for service as well as um, radio transmits. And you can see that on the police side, calls for service is staying relatively flat, but on the, the transmits, they're actually decreasing. We've worked very hard over the last few years to keep trying to come up with ways to do uh, less push to talks or less radio communication, and uh, that appears to be working at the police board. Fire board, same type of thing. Uh, you can see that their calls for service are, are rising slightly. However, the uh, push to talks or radio transmissions are basically level. EMS, those calls are increasing, and then uh, on the radio side, there's more calls, so there's more radio transmissions as well. So any questions on these charts? Commissioner. Uh, uh, not on the chart, Scott, but on uh, your response or item number six, you talk about the 1,798 hours of assistance. Right. How many people does that represent? Well, there's a couple that are very active as temporary status. Um, one of those persons worked uh, over 600 hours, and the other one was uh, right around 500 hours, and then the remaining were um, about three people that made up, three or four people that made up the rest of the hours. Okay. So with that, that's the director's report. Thank you. Do we need a motion to accept this? That's just informational in nature. Very good. We'll move on to item number five, presentation of financial statements year to date, December 31, 2021. Good afternoon, Anna Raker, business manager for Metro Communications. We'll start with our um, December 31st, 2021 year-end financial statements. Uh, these financial statements, as in the past, reflect adjusting entries for audit preparation. So they're a combination of, a bit of a combination of government-wide and fund accounting presentation. And we do that because there are bits and pieces of both information that's valuable to you as a governing board, such as assets and depreciation and different things like that. So I'll start with the balance sheet for December 31st. And the first thing I'm gonna point out to you is clearly our cash balance is much healthier in 2021 as it was in comparison to 2020. And the significant amount of that is due to the fact that in 2020, we had three months of 911 surcharge um, payable. The state was just a little slow in remitting the surcharges we normally receive in December, but they were on time in 2021. And if you look at the lines directly below with the due from um, government and due to 
um, do from state, you can see that the difference is a third more or th in 2020 than it was in 2020, um, than 2021. So that's a good chunk of it right there. The balance of it is that we had some employment gaps last year, and we also saved some funds in various areas, which allowed us to use less cash than we had originally budgeted. Certainly not intended, but that's where we landed. And so you're seeing a, an increase in cash just simply due to that. Um, looking down at fixed assets, the significant change there is final depreciation on a significant asset. And um, that's the software for Zerker. And um, so with that significant depreciation, um, the depreciation in 21 was quite a bit less than in 2020. As far as the rest of the assets in comparison to 2020, I don't have anything really significant to point out. Uh, Metro remains in a, in a good place financially and we're very transparent about the fact that that is due in great part to the support from the city and the county. And of course, we were formed by the city and the county in order to provide these services and so it's reflective of that. Any questions about the year-end balance sheet? Okay. See, seeing none, you may proceed. Thank you. Uh, the next view we give you is a summary view of 2021 compared to 2020 looking at revenues and expenditures. And something I will point out here in, in a positive note um, is that the 911 surcharges grew 1.56% over 2020. And that's good. We haven't seen that growth for a few years. And there's a few things that are reflected in that. Over the year, I've, I've shared with you that um, the statewide subscriber numbers are relatively flat, and they continue to remain fairly flat. But uh, the subscriber numbers within Minnehaha County and the city of Sioux Falls, both in Minnehaha County and Lincoln County, continue to grow. And so we're taking a larger amount of that flat share. Um, for the, a good chunk of the year, our incentive funds were fairly flat, and that was due in great part to the statewide numbers being flat. So remember with surcharges, we get 70% of the $1.25 going through all the counties for the subscribers residing in the counties and the communities for which they serve. And so that reflects our growth. But the incentive funds that go to PSAPs that meet certain criteria and we're one of those. And that those incentive fund percentages change only when the size or the consolidation of a PSAP that qualifies changes, or in years five of census when the population is readjusted. And it always takes them about a year or perhaps even more than a year to reflect those changes. And so in, the, in I think in July of 2021, we saw a slight increase due to the reflection of the population growth. And that garnered us a larger share of the incentive funds. And so the combination of those gives us an increase, which is good for future budget projections. And Scott will touch on that a bit. When you see our budget, you're gonna see that we projected some growth there. The county and city share, as you know, is a 25% increase as budgeted. The growth in uh, services, um, 147,000 approximately this in 21 compared to 132,5 in 20, is due in great part to EMS growth. Um, whether it was COVID or, or whatever kind of changes were going on in 20, we saw a dip in some of those EMS transfers. And um, that, gr that rebounded in 21, and the trend is strong again. Payroll, um, you can see the difference there, um, but I'm gonna caution you there because that includes year-end adjusting entries for net pension. And so if you recall, we talk about GASB 68 every year, which is the adjustment we need to do for the local government's um, staff who participate in SDRS. And when you get to the detail page, you're going to see the difference in adjustments. 
And um, so this is a little misleading when you just look at the summary version. Operating expenses, uh, the thing I'm going to point out here is under insurance, the 38823 includes a change that um, was made statewide. And for entities like Metro who receive or purchase insurance through the South Dakota Public Assurance Alliance for property and casualty liability, um, we used to report a vested interest which was a non-cash amount, and they've changed that reporting. And, and so in order to make that change in 2021, we had to do an adjustment which pulled it out of an asset which required us to report it as an expense. It's really not an expense. It's a, it's a non-cash adjustment. And so it doesn't affect our cash at the end of the year, but it's an accounting entry. And then when you see the difference in depreciation from 2020 to 2021, as explained earlier, um, our CAD software, uh, the Zerker, our share of that cost is fully depreciated, and that really is the bulk of that change. So any qu questions about the summary comparison to prior year? Okay. The next um, slide shows you a budget versus actual. And as you requested in the past, we show you the year to date and we've adjusted this for the revised year to date budget. As you recall, we did a budget amendment in December and so this reflects that amendment. And then we show the annual and so you see the variance in dollars and then the percentage. So we address the growth in surcharges and you can see that in um, the dollar amounts. And um, we talked a little bit about the PSAP revenues and the audio recordings in EMS, and I shared that there was a significant growth in EMS surcharges. Scrolling down to personnel, um, as you see in personnel, you'll see this right here, this minus 291,000 personnel expenditure. That reduction is the adjusting entry for net pension liabilities and assets. Um, and so we made a move from 2020 to 2021. The adjusting change was um, creating a net pension asset as, as opposed to a net pension liability, and that shows up as a reduction in expenses in our adjusting entries at year end. It's non-cash. GASB is used to reflect at a local level what's going on with exposure and contributions and future benefits for and current benefits for our staff. As you can see, we were very close to our year-end operating um, expenditures. But again, you see this 38,000 here, which is a non-cash amount. So even though it looks like we went over budget by $1,310, for the Department of Legislative Audit, they don't look at non-cash amounts. And so for their purposes, um, they would subtract out uh, the 24,000 that was the adjustment for that vested interest that the state or SDPA is no longer having us report through Department of Legislative Audit. And so that means we actually were under budget once you make that adjustment. Our only capital asset purchase was $7,000 for a 911 simulator, um, which we presented to you earlier last year. So any questions about um, the December finances and the financial reports. Any questions? Mm -mm. And again, on this item, do we uh, need a motion to accept now? So could we have a motion? Move for approval. Second. Okay. Motion made by Commissioner Bennigan, seconded by Commissioner Council uh, Karski. Uh, roll call vote, please. 
Sure. Commissioner Benninga? Aye. Council Member Kiley? Yes. Council Member Erickson? Yes. Commissioner Karski? Aye. Okay, that passes unanimously. That takes us to item number six, presentation of financial statements year to date, February 28, 2022. Okay, these are your financials through the end of February of this year. Um, and so now we're comparing to last year. And so the on the balance sheet, you'll notice uh, a bit of the opposite of what we saw with cash in uh, the comparison of 21 to 20. And um, so um, in 2021, the state was behind a month. They were slightly delayed in sending surcharge money uh, to the counties and to Metro. Um, we got ours deposited by the end of the month. Um, and I'm sure that the county had a difficult time getting theirs deposited by the last day of the month, plus transferred to us because it came in right about that time. So you'll see that reflected once we present March reports. Um, and that's why there is no, there isn't a, a due from state because we received our funds and deposited them by check. But the funds that flowed through the county, they need a day or two in order to get them to us. And they're usually pretty quick. It was just, it was right at the last of the month. And so you take that 193,000 here and you put it up here and you're, you can see that it's very similar. And so things have kind of righted themselves by that point. As far as the rest of the balance sheet activity, there's not a lot of activity that affects the current year in the first month or two. Much of that is prior year adjustments. If you think about the fact that um, surcharge revenue for the prior year is estimated and um, affects due from, um, there's not a significant amount of revenue, so there's a slight budget or uh, balance sheet change. Um, if you look at accounts payable, a significant amount of this was the timing of some insurances that were billed late by insurance companies in the transition to 2022 along with um, SDRS, sometimes we're able to pay them before the end of the month and sometimes we pay them following the end of the month. They're actually due the 15th following the end of the month. So any questions about the balance sheet? Okay. The next schedule is a prior year actual versus summary. And um, so you can see the city and county share um, the city's um, receipt was received um, around the 1st of March, and so that will write itself um, with the next financials. And then the difference in services here is I billed Brandon for their first quarter um, PSAP fee in 2021 in February of 21, but I billed them in March of uh, 22. Um, and it, it has to do with the timing of ensuring that the audit um, is at a point where I'm confident that I'm doing an accurate reconciliation. So you'll see that in the next um, report. Uh, you can see a, a increase in personnel, which is logical based on step and COLA increases. Um, and we've been working on staffing, as Scott reported. And then as far as um, expenses, there's not a lot of expenses at this point in the year. It's, it's pretty minimal. Um, a lot of these are prepaid expenses carried forward from prior months and then our ongoing operating expenses like uh, connectivity for simulcast and um, phone and dispatch, that kind of thing. So any questions about that comparison? Go ahead. Okay. So the last chart is a comparison of budget to actual. And now we're looking at the 2022 budget. And so the year to date is two months and the annual budget is the full year. And so um, our bud we're budgeted to add $99,451 to cash in 2022. So again, you're not gonna see any surcharge in these first two months because surcharges are 45 days behind. So our first month of surcharge revenue is in March. 
and we have received those. Um, again, the city receipts are have been received, um, so those are on track. And the um, PSAP service fee was billed, it's billed quarterly, and that was billed in March. EMS transfer fees and audio recordings look to be on track. It's early, but they're looking good for now. Scrolling down to personnel, um, this reflects um, the additional hires Scott talked about, but we do have some vacancies and um, those grant funded positions, the local dollar funded positions are in the works. And so um, it looks really good right now, but once we add those staff, this will change slightly. I will point out that our group health insurance came in very low. We fared very, very well. And so that is going to help us um, in, in a good way. And this is, we've had multiple years where it's gone well. So um, as far as expenditures, um, again, we, we report prepaids and try to apply them across the month so that your year to date is relevant to the percentage of the year whenever possible to help you see where we're at financially. Any questions? Okay, could I have a motion to accept presentation of financial statements year to date, February 28th to 2022? So moved, Benninger. Second. Moved by Benninger, seconded by Karski. Roll call vote, please. Commissioner Benninger? Aye. Council Member Kiley? Yes. Council Member Erickson? Yes. Council or Commissioner Karski? Aye. Great. Next item, item number seven, acceptance of final audited 2021 financial report. I'm pleased to report that our 2021 financial audit is complete. It's been reviewed and approved by the South Dakota Department of Legislative Audit, prepared by our independent auditor, Zaid Bailey. Our financial statements were found to fairly, represent, or fairly present the financial position of Metro without modification. Our auditors continue to issue a qualified opinion in regards to our decision to remove the reporting of GASB 75 OPEB, other post-employment benefits, um, um, which is a liability. And we made that decision beginning in 2018 and we continue to, um, pro we continue to um, report or choose to not report in that regard. Um, it's important to note, and we do this every year, but I just want to um, note again that our auditor's opinion is only modified um, for the decision to not report OPEB liability. All other areas of our financial statements received an unmodified opinion. Sometimes auditors' modified opinions can cover more or all of the financial statements if there are pervasive issues found, but that's not the case for Metro, it's only the OPEB. Um, just to give you a little bit of a reminder and a background for those here in attendance who aren't familiar, when this decision was originally made in 2018, we reflected on the fact that our agency has been an independent agency since January of 2008, and since that time, we have had at the most a single retiree accessing those benefits, and in, and in all instances, it's been a single benefit, not an employee spouse, employee child, or family. Um, and their election to, is, is to purchase single group health insurance, um, dental and vision. So for 2018 through 2021, the decision to remove GASB um, 75, which is OPEB reporting was made after consultation and recommendation from the city of Sioux Falls Finance. Once we determined that the contract services that were required to measure that liability um, was cost prohibited, prohibitive, and the removal of the reporting wouldn't negatively impact the agency. It would result in this modified opinion. Um, so all things considered, we determined that the cost versus the modified opinion was in the best interest of the agency and therefore the support of the county and the city. Um, if there are are any questions about the information that was placed on the website last week and that is provided here. If you want me to review anything, I certainly can. Commissioners wish 
for any review. Mm -hmm. Looks like we're good. All right. Then I request the council accept the audited 2021 financial report as approved by the South Dakota Department of Legislative Audit and presented today. Move for approval. Second. Okay. Moved by uh, Commissioner Benegas, second by Karski. Uh, roll call vote, please. All right. Commissioner Benegay? Aye. Council Member Kiley? Yes. Council Member Erickson? Yes. Commissioner Karski? Yes. All right, very good. That's unanimous. We move on to item number eight, Thank presentation you. of 2023 budget. Thank you, Anna. And Mr. Chairman, before I begin on the budget PowerPoint, I do need to make just a slight correction to my director's report. I said I had spoke before the uh, South Dakota 9-1 Coordination Board. Actually, it was a South Dakota 911 um, monthly meeting that I spoke at. So it wasn't the Coordination Board, but a monthly meeting. Okay, thank you. Okay, so this is our 2023 uh, Metro Communications Agency budget request. Just want to give you a little bit of information about our agency. Currently, we're at 57 full-time authorized staff. Uh, four of those are those grant-funded positions that uh, we received money for um, back in 2020-21. We're still trying to hire those four positions because they, they must be above and beyond uh, what we're currently um, paying for out of our own budget. So they, they have to be an additional four positions. Administrative staff. We have the director, deputy director, business manager, uh, technology coordinator, quality assurance coordinator, training coordinator, and two division supervisors, which are new to the two division supervisors are new to our agency this year. And uh, we began working with those two individuals um, about two months ago and are already making great progress uh, in some of the things that we outlined for them to do. So we have eight supervisors currently. We have eight advanced communication operators. Our advanced communication operators serve as both trainers as well as shift leads. And then we have uh, 33 operators and then one part-time business support services. Um, I'll let you know that we, we just made that offer in the past week for the business support position. So we're really looking forward to that position and how it's going to help enable Anna to, um, to focus on some HR needs and some financial needs um, that this will give her a better ability, better time to be able to do that with the support. So thank you very much for helping us out with that position. Some of our 2021 accomplishments. Our uh, most successful accomplishment is that the city of Sioux Falls and Minneapolis County approved funding to include Metro Communications as a component to the public safety training campus, which will be complete in October of 23. And the reason why that's so important to our organization is, as like Mr. Kipley said earlier, we're working out of some pretty tight space right now. Our, our services continue to grow. Our need for um, additional staffing continue to grow. And uh, as a result of all those things, we just need more space to, to be able to do our business. So we're very appreciative that the county is willing to fund the, the FF and E for the new facility and that the city has funded the, the actual uh, brick and mortar space of where we need to be. Metro Communications was approved for four additional operators in 2022 through 2023, which I already mentioned is a grant-funded opportunity. <clears throat> Next item is uh, Metro Communications successfully completed our eighth reaccreditation as an International Academy of Emergency Dispatch Accredited Center of Excellence. Metro is only one of six in the world to have achieved eight reaccreditations. Okay. So, it's pretty important to our agency. Uh, we know that we're providing top quality emergency medical dispatch services. We know that we're following the protocols as outlined from a national uh, academy. So we're just very appreciative that our operators continue to, um, to make adjustments, to, to stay to fairly strict protocols to, able, to enable our agency to be one of the best. And, and obviously, like I just said, we're one of six in the world. So. Um, very, very appreciative staff for the work that they do. That's fantastic. Good job. 
Metro transitioned to a continuous posting process, which I mentioned earlier in the director's report. Um, that has really helped us bring in more applicants. Last year, we had 280 applications. We interviewed and tested um, through our testing process. We had over 200 people go through that, and then we conducted interviews of, of those that were successful in the testing process. Our retention improved last year, having only two full-time employees that resigned. Now, we did have a number of uh, people that resigned during the actual training portion of the 26 weeks of training that we have our officers go through, but uh, you know, on the full-time side, we just had two resignations. Our growth summary, I'm just gonna go through this quickly because I pretty much talked about it in the director's report, but um, calls for service, or telephone calls were up, 911 calls were up, non-emergency calls were up, outbound calls were down. Next page uh, talks about our calls for service where we're actually sending somebody out for police, fire, EMS response. Again, I talked about this in the director's report, but you can see that there's increases in all those areas, but specifically EMS calls are, are up uh, at 10%. Call answer time and text messaging. Again, this was in the director's report, but uh, um, very proud of those stats. And then we had something new to us this year. Um, in March of 2021, South Dakota 91 enacted um, text to 911, and since March to December, there were 377 sessions. That's 377 circumstances where somebody contacted us by a text message. As a result of that contact, we had 1,981 incoming messages, and we sent out 1,792 outgoing messages. So, it's uh, it's definitely being used. I think there's. Uh, great reasons to have text to 911 and uh, it's you know it's been successful for us we haven't had any any complaints or issues that I'm aware of related to that okay the next uh, page here is our our budget request and let me just find my sheet here got a little bit of Okay, so on this, um, you can see our 2022, which is in yellow, and our 2023, which is the blue proposed. Uh, maybe just a couple items to, to point out or a couple line items. Uh, the first being the very first line, which is the 9-1 surcharges. You can see that there's a slight increase in those surcharges, 1.5%. Uh, um, and then you can see on line two and three with the city and county contributions, in the previous year, this year, 2022, we asked for 15%. In 2023, uh, we're reducing that to 8%. And if you remember our five-year plan, which included the two years of 25%, and then 15%, and then eight, um, our original plan was for 9%, but we've reduced that to eight because we think, uh, we think we can do that at 8% based on our projected cost. Um, line seven, other revenue, you'll see that the 342,000 is in there, $778 is in there for the uh, um, grant funded positions. Maybe the next thing to point out is item 11, which is personnel salaries. And then of course, uh, the next few lines after that, benefits, retirement, health insurance. Um, those things are a big portion of our agency's budget. And in this case, it's 5 million, $357,833, so um, about 89% of our overall budget. Um, after that, you can see there's just our operating expenses, just various uh, maintenance contracts, rentals, um, professional services. You'll see in 2023, professional services did uh, did increase due to you know some janitorial expenses and so forth at the new facility. Um, there will also be uh, on repairs, there'll be some additional um, costs related to maintenance contracts, that type of thing. But all of those are fairly, um, fairly similar to 2022. And then on line 29, capital outlay, you can see that we've added the 25,000 in there. Um, we need to hear back on that radio replacement project that I talked about at our current center. It's possible that uh, there may not uh, be any funds needed if it's a state covered 
situation or if we can get grant funds if, uh, if it is something that we have to pay for. But those are, we're still waiting to hear on a quote. We're still waiting to hear um, whether or not that'll be funded under a, a different opportunity. So, but for now we did, we did put the 25,000 in there to try and start uh, increasing our capital outlay. So I think with that, unless there's any questions, um, that's, it's very status quo to this year as far as what we're asking for in 2023. We're not asking for additional staff or, or anything um, really beyond what we've asked for in this year's budget. Any questions at this point, commissioners? I just want to clarify, did you say that you had 280 applicants? Throughout, I miss hear that. Yep, throughout the entire year. Now, keep in mind that uh, we get a lot of applicants that apply, but then they don't follow through. You know, they don't follow up for, we've got several steps in our, in our recruitment process. So the first is apply. Second is a phone interview, which sometimes they don't follow through with that. And then after that, there's a, we give them a presentation about, a, we call it a virtual recruitment Academy, which is basically it shows how uh, metro operations happen, what a dispatcher does in a, in a day's work. Um, it really just gives them a glimpse of what an operator does. So sometimes people fail to follow through with that. And then uh, the next process is the written listening test. Sometimes, again, uh, people fail to keep following through the process. So by the time we get to the point of, of interviews, uh, many of them have either not followed through or not passed the testing requirements or the standards that we have in place. That's a huge engagement for two resignations over the year, obviously. Well, we need to keep in mind that we're trying to fill positions that we lost in 2020. So there was 11 people that uh, resigned right. from our agency in 2020. So we're trying to fill those in 2021, which is the reason why we had uh, that many recruitment opportunities and, and that many applicants. Councilor Erickson, do you have any questions on the phone? I do not, thank you for asking. You're welcome, sorry that I've ignored you up to this point. <laughs> I'm really upset about it. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions? All right, you can proceed, then, okay. Scott. So the next item is uh, future capital outlay. One of the things we've been in discussion with the Sioux Falls Police Department on for quite some time is an additional police council in 2024. You know, our original discussions, we'd kind of talked about 2023. We pushed that back because of the, the new facility and, and uh, a number of other items. So. But currently we're, we're in discussions. Um, we've, we've identified it as 2024, but it could certainly be 2025 uh, um, if, if need be. Another thing we talked about is renovations to our current facility. Um, there are some light renovations that we'd like to do. We, we anticipate the public safety building being where it is for a number of years. We anticipate um, operating from that as a backup center for a number of years. So in anticipation of that, there are just some light, uh, you know, enhancements that we could make that would, uh, that would improve the facilities as a backup center. And we're, we just earmarked 2025, but it could certainly be another year. Re replacement radio consoles, we, uh, you know, I said earlier by 2028, we'd like to try and do that by 2026 if possible, just to, so we're not in it at the tail end or last minute of it. And then additional fire council, we've had discussions with Sioux Falls Fire Rescue um, about the number of calls that are handled at our fire boards. And uh, you know, through those conversations, we've just identified 2026 as a possibility year to try and uh, increase staffing at, at that particular board. I do have some charts to go through here to help justify those uh, added councils that police and fire. So these are charts that we've shown you at a previous Metro Management uh, Council meeting. Um, so the first one talks about police east and police west, and then there's some numbers like 157, 185 in red. Uh, what, this, what these charts are representing is push to talks at our police boards during January of 21. 
January is typically our slowest month of the year, or slower month of the year. And what we did is we tried to determine how much work is being done at these councils and uh, push to talk type of work, which is we can do three of those, or three push to talks in a minute. Is so every 18 seconds or so, we're having a radio transmission, which requires us to listen, to comprehend, and then take some type of action. So if you did three a minute times 60 minutes, that'll equal the 180 or the 185 that you see at the top of the chart there. So the other thing that we talk about in this chart is agency occupancy. And what agency occupancy means is, well, that's a threshold for amount of time that a person can be occupied or a person can be working. And if you, for example, took that uh, 30 minutes of the hour you worked, the other 30 minutes you didn't work, or you had break time or downtime, um, that would show a 50% agency occupancy for that particular hour. Our threshold, like I said, is, is to be 85% or at 85% threshold, which means 85% uh, of our maximum, so 185 calls in an hour, 85% of that would place at a, or not calls, push to talks in an hour, 85% of that would put us 157 push to talks in an hour's time. So the goal is, is to not always be at 85% because that's, that's burnout stage, so we want to be less than that. So if you look at the chart where the green is, less than 157, our goal would be 70% of the time to be at less than 57. So you can see like at six o'clock in the morning, seven o'clock in the morning, we're at 100%, eight o'clock in the morning, 90%. Those all reach our goal up until about 11 o'clock, and then you can see we drop below that 70%, um, really up until about two o'clock on this chart, we're okay. And then after the, the late evening hours, we fall below 70%, and then in the evening hours, it, it, we get back above 70% again. Ideally, that's where we want to be is 70% of the time, we want to be less than at 157. The next chart, which places us into the yellow zone, which is above 85%, now this is where we start to um, go above that recommended agency occupancy standard. Here you can see that you know, we would like to be no more than 30% of the time would we like to be in that area. You can see there are some times where we're at 50%, 60, um, 64% um, in the late afternoon hours. And then the last is the 185, which we don't want to be in that area at all, but you can see that there are some late afternoon hours um, where we are at 38% or 45% of the time we're, we're in that, that particular burnout stage. So these are just a quick representation of agency occupancy and push to talks in our agency. And like again, the idea is to 70% of the time be in the green, no more than 30% being in the yellow. But uh, we also understand that there's going to be certain events, certain times that will push you into the red that's not uh, a continuous, but it's some special event or something that pushes you into the, uh, the red area. So any questions on that at all? Okay. Then the next uh, slide is just a representation, a graphical representation of where the red is or where the, the zones are, the time zones where we're experiencing um, above that 85%, so it's, it's pretty much in the afternoon hours. And as a result of this, as we look at this, maybe this is something that, you know, when we create a, if we create another police board, we can maybe look at it so that it doesn't have to be a 24 seven environment. Maybe it can be less than that and, and um, give us an opportunity to, to work into it. And the next page uh, is a request to the summary. So on the revenue side, again, you can see 91 surcharges are 2.7 million. Um, some other revenue is 506,000. So our total revenue, external revenue is 3,267,401. And then you have the contributions from the city of Sioux Falls, uh, $2,093,815. And then Minneapolis County, $697,937 for a total revenue of external and internal revenue of $6,059,153, which is a 5.6% increase. Expenses, personnel, uh, again, that's at 5.3 million. Operating costs, 616,000, and then the capital that we have in there for 25,000. So total expenses are $5,999,679. It's just a quick recap of, of the budget. Any questions at all? Any questions? 
Councillor Erickson, any questions? Nope, thank you. Can I have a motion to accept the presentation of the 2023 budget? So moved. The presentation, I don't think we, because we're no, not taking no, any no. action on it, so I don't think we need to do I anything. So. Okay, good. Disinformational only. We're good to go. Mr. Chairman, there is a need for an executive session today. Yes. For contract negotiation. All right. Item number nine is executive session for the purposes of and as authorized by South Dakota Codified Law 125, 2, 1, 3, and 4. Can I have a motion? Um, Commissioner. Typically, we have to recess for a few minutes to shut down our system. So can we just do a recess for about seven minutes, or do, isn't that necessary? What's that? Can we go next door? Well, well the There's next voting. door is absentee voting balloting. Next door. That's oh. my question. Are we remaining here, or are we going next we'll door? We'll remain we here. Okay. Yes. How, many, how many people do you have? Three, four, seven, eight. There's seven or eight. You guys know that room better than I. What do you think? It's a small room. Yeah, it's, it's a very small room. Probably more for four people than it is for yeah, eight. <laughs> I'd propose that we recess for um, five minutes. That's fine. Okay. And then we'll take the motion after that. All right. Uh, we are in recess. We'll be back. Councilor Kiley, do you, do you want to?